All righty, how's everybody doing this morning? All righty, how's everybody doing this morning? Thank you. Praise the Lord. So I hope you're doing well. Well, I invite you to open up your Bibles to Psalm chapter 19. Psalm chapter 19, we're in the Old Testament. Next two Sundays, we're going to be looking at this psalm. It's a beautiful psalm. And this morning's message is called God's World Book. God's World Book. The God that can be seen from the very things that He's made. He's given us a book called The World, and the other book is the one that Eric is holding. That's another book He's given us, right? Amen. Would you join me as I read these? I'm going to read uh, six verses this morning, and Lord willing, this is going to be uh, uh, just these six verses we're looking at this morning, all right? God's Word says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the ferment shows His handiwork. A day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them He has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of His chamber. And rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of the heaven and its circuit to the other end. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. God, we do pray that you will bless us as we are gathered this morning to learn about your word as we study this, these six verses in Psalm 19. Wonderful, poetic words written by David. Lord, we thank you. For these words, and I pray that they would be a great encouragement to us, and they would strengthen our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen? Well, according to C.S. Lewis, I'm not sure if you all know who C.S. Lewis is, philosopher, writer, author, wrote many, many books, and smart guy. Uh, At one time in his life, he did not believe in God. Um, He wasn't a a Christian or a follower of Christ at all, but he did become one later on in his life. According to him, he says Psalm 19 is the greatest poem in the Psalter, in the Psalms, the greatest poem, and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. For most Christians, most Christians' point of view, it is the nearest summary of what is known as the doctrine of revelation, a God revealing himself. It's a wonderful summary. Namely, God is making himself known to us in the things that he has made. And these first verses here in Psalm 16 reveal that to us. So for the next two Sundays, if you let me, right, we're going to take a break from the one another's, right? And these, uh, this Psalm right here is broken up into two parts. The first part is what I call, or actually I stole it from somebody else, right? God's world book. Okay, those are the first six verses. And then verses 7 through 11 is God's Word book, which is the Bible that we hold in our hands. And then verses 12 through 14 is the worshiper's response to the things that God has made. And I hope in studying this psalm together, it will encourage our faith. It will encourage our faith and strengthen our faith. It will help us to learn that we can see God through creation. And hopefully it will give us a greater boldness in our worship of God and also in our witness to the world. Because when you understand what God has done and the very things that He's made and left for us as a witness to Himself, when you understand the depth of that, and not even in the depth of it, just a surface level of what God has done for you and I, you you will be encouraged. I believe your faith will be strengthened. I believe that your your witness for God will be given greater boldness and and you will want to worship Him. You and I, living closer to the city, we don't get to see the sky as those who live out in the country and those who live closer to those things, but it's a wonderful, wonderful reminder, this psalm, of what God has given to us in His creation. Paul has, has 
used this truth that uh, God has revealed himself in the things that he's made when Paul the Apostle was roaming the earth and he was going around planting churches. He came to certain cities that were not um, Jewish in nature. They were Gentiles. They didn't believe in God. And he would use creation in his witness to appeal to them, to teach them about the God that they're not worshiping, but the God that they ought to worship. Just listen to this, all right? Acts chapter 14, verse 17 says this. Nevertheless, he, meaning God, did not leave himself without witness. God did not leave himself without witness. He's left a witness of himself. And this is what Paul says in Acts 14, as he's speaking to these Gentile people there, he's witnessing to them. And this is the witness he gave, in that he did good. God did good. He gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. This is what God has done through the very things that he's made. In Acts chapter 17, as Paul comes into Athens, the the city is given over to idols. He sees it. And uh, they had a statue there in Athens that they were... uh, titling that statue to the, to the unknown God. And so they had all these different philosophies, and, and one of the statues that were there was, was representing the unknown God. And then, so Paul spent the whole chapter there in Acts chapter 17 showing them from the very things that God has made, that God has revealed himself to them through creation, this whole discourse to the philosophers there. And then we have this in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Listen to this. For since the creation of the world, His, meaning God, His invisible attributes are clearly seen. So that's something that is invisible. He's saying it is clearly seen, okay? So there's something about God that is invisible. He's saying it's clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that, and this is the conclusion, so that they meaning all people are without excuse. And so what Paul is saying there in Romans chapter 1, I encourage you to read that. And Actually, later on in my message, I'm going to quote some more of Romans chapter 1. Paul is saying that everybody in the world is left without excuse, that God has left himself a witness in the very things that he's made, that no one can say there is no God. Now, obviously, people do, right? And so we're going to get to that as well. But God has left the witness of himself in the very things that he's made. And so you and I never really have to try to prove that God exists. We don't have to argue for his existence. God has left a witness of himself in the very things that he's made, to which Paul says this means that man, regardless of, of where they are at, has no excuse for his unbelief. He has no excuse for his rejection of God because, listen, There is something about God, something about God that God has communicated to all people about himself. And this psalm that we're looking at, Psalm 19, is a beautiful, beautiful psalm written by King David, probably reflecting in a moment when he's out in the field tending the sheep as a little shepherd boy, right? And as he looks up at the sky, he's studying the sky, which he would watch, And he sees and he hears God talking to him through the very things that God has made. And so it's a wonderful, wonderful revelation of God himself. The big book is creation. The little book is the one that we're learning, reading from. You you can have the big book that points you that there is a God, but you need to have this little book because this little book is special, specific revelation The big book tells us that there is a God, but it can't save you. It leaves you with no excuse to know that there is a God, but you need to have this little book to tell you how to get saved, to who who exactly God is that you're worshiping. So I pray that this psalm is a great great encouragement to you this morning. Build your faith up in in the most holy God. And so as we look at these first six verses, I already said this, but let me say it again. This is what theologians call general revelation. So there's two kinds of revelation. You tracking with me? Just nod your heads, we'll get done faster. 
Two kinds of revelation. General revelation that God re- has revealed Himself to all people in creation, right? And then there is specific or particular revelation. That is special revelation, which we have in our hands, the Word of God. You need one to, sh- to tell you that there is a God, and the other one tells you how to know that God through the Scriptures. General revelation. Creation reveals the nature of God. It reveals that enough about God to cause all people to want to know who this God is. General revelation is enough to tell every human that there is a God and a creator who they can know. It's enough to tell them something about God, not his moral attributes. You can know a little bit about God's love, but his holiness and things of that nature, you cannot know. But there's enough to know about God through creation. You can tell by looking at creation that God is a powerful God. He's all powerful. You can see that through creation. You can obviously tell that that there's got to be something of intelligence, a divine nature, something of intelligence for these things that we look at in creation. In fact, this truth of being able to see something about God in creation can be carried over to many things in life. You can witness to people just by the very things that we see in creation. When you go to a building, right, and you look at that building, you don't have to know the builder. You don't have to see that the building was built. The building itself is evidence that there must be a builder because there's design to that building. The building itself tells us that there's a purpose or a reason for the building being there. It's just not there for nothing. And that tells you that the builder must have had a builder. And the same thing as you look at drawings on, uh, on the wall or someone who's an artist and they paint this wonderful, wonderful picture. You, you don't have to see them drawing that picture and all the time that it take them, took them to, to draw that painting, but just by looking at the painting and studying it and just e- examining it in a simple way, says that there's design to that picture. There's thought that went into it. There's details and a creativity that tells you that somebody drew that picture. And so it is with creation. Look at verse 1. It says that the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens tell or proclaiming the glory of God in the ferment or the skies show His handiwork. I see two things that verse 1 is saying about God. One, it reveals God's glory. The heavens or the skies above us are declaring or telling something of the glory of God. Now, this is written from a Jewish perspective, right? Uh, A Jewish person wrote these words. And so as a worshiper having that kind of mindset, he sees something of the glory of God or something of the heaviness of God or, or something of the riches of God or the splendor of God, something about God telling him that this, because this creation is so glorious, right, that God must be glory, glorious too. It reveals the glory of God, the splendor of God. One commentary, George MacDonald, written back in the 1900s, says that the heavens tell us an unbelievable, remarkable story. If you traveled at the speed of light, I'm not sure if these, because this is written down in the 1900s, I'm not sure how accurate it is today for, I know I have some scientific people in my congregation, so forgive me if I get these facts wrong, if they're outdated. I didn't check on it. So if you traveled at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, or roughly 6 trillion miles a year, it would take us 10 billion years to reach the farthest point we can see with a telescope. But this would still be far from the outermost limits of space. Now, astronomers think that space may have no bounds or no limits at all. Our Earth is nothing but a speck in a vastless, timeless expanse that you and I can only see with our eyes. Just a little speck compared to everything else that God has created. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing that the heavens declare the glory of God. So the heavens declare the glory of God, the ferment shows or proclaims His handiwork. That's the second thing that I see here. It reveals something about God. It reveals His handiwork or 
handiwork. Think of that word. Think, it, it's something of his wisdom, something of God's thought, something of God's handiwork, something of his, uh, listen, finger work. It reveals something of details. So many things in God's creation reveals thought and detail that God took to create this wonderful thing that the Bible says here, that, that the heavens declare the glory of God and the ferments, the skies, show his finger work, his handiwork. The creator's handiwork, his design and intelligence is seen in the things that he has created. It shows us that God is a glorious God by saying, look at these stars, look at these stars. They are glorious. If the stars are glorious, how much more is the God who created those stars glorious? Amen? And so as we think, and how did the stars get there? The stars revealed to us the handiwork of God because it took wisdom, it took intelligence. The stars tell us that God is handy. God is really smart and intelligent. So all of this is, is being revealed to you and I. The heavens declare the glory of God and the ferment shows His handiwork. But this is being done on a continuous way, over and over again, on a continuous basis to all mankind, God is revealing that He's a glory, glorious God, that He's an intelligent God. Look at verse 2. He says, day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. And to utter speech is to pour forth speech like a spring would pour forth water. In other words, it's, it's telling us that God doesn't take a day off. Over and over again, continuously, God is revealing to creation a knowledge of himself not only that he is God, but it's revealing to all people on a continuous, abundant fashion that he is the God who created all these things. And so the person without a scientific background can find God. He can see God in the simple things that God has made. With a simple search, a simple glance, a simple pondering, not much thought needs to go into seeing that God created all these things. In other words, it doesn't take a scientist, to discover that God created all that we see. We see. He has revealed himself in an abundant fashion. His wordless speech is coming forth from that which he has made to all mankind in an abundant fashion. But because this comes to us in an abundant manner, coming forth in a continuous way, the deeper you go, in other words, you don't have to be afraid of people who come to you with that scientific mind and they question the things that you believe regarding creation, right? You don't have to worry about that because, because it's coming in an abundant, continuous fashion that God is revealing himself in the things that he's made. There's nowhere you can go where you don't see God. And you can study it and go into the deep things of studying all the things that God has made and you don't have to worry about, oh, wow, well, this is going to catch God off guard here, and God didn't think of this, and, and maybe, maybe there is no God. There's no thought that goes into that. There's nothing to worry about. And so God's revelation of himself is coming forth in a continuous manner. But not only that, it is also universal. It doesn't matter what language or what cultural background or what makeup you have. You can see it, you can hear it, and you can know him. Look at verses 3 and 4. He says, There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. There is no speech or language where the voice, creation, is speaking. This wordless book of God's creation is heard by all. He says it's plain. It is plain to everyone in the world, no matter where you are or where you go, this communication from God is universal. It's coming in a continuous basis, but it's also universal. God's voice in creation is speaking to every single person all over the world, no matter where they are. Listen to how Paul puts it, as I told you earlier, that I would be reading again from Romans chapter 1. In fact, if you don't mind, if you have a Bible, 
Um, I, we don't have Mark with us to put this up on the screen for us, but Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 20. This is a very important passage of Scripture. God's Word says, For the wrath of God, God's anger, God's, God's obviously it's not an a, a, a uncontrolled anger. His controlled anger is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, those who want to live in an ungodly way, and unrighteousness, those who, who, who say there is no right, there is no wrong, you just live the way you want to, right? His anger, His wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness, by their wicked living, or by their sinful living, suppress the truth. Suppress means to hold down. And so what they know to be true, not my truth, not your truth, but the truth about who God is and how God is revealing Himself in creation. Romans chapter 1, Paul is concluding that, that people in their sinful behavior are holding down the truth that, the, that God is the creator in their sinful lifestyle. They're holding it down. Now, what he says in verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them, is evident to them. Why? Look at the next phrase. Because God has shown it to them. Did you hear that? We don't know what's going on in people's hearts. People can put the front up and act like, you know, they're, they got it all together and, and uh, you know, they've outsmarted uh, the smartest person in the world kind of a thing. And, you know, you can believe what you want to believe and this is how I'm taking it, right? And there they putting all this front on. But God knows what's going on in that person's heart. You know why? Because he's already revealed it to him. God's already spoken and already communicated to each and in individual per people all over the world that he's God are the very things that he's made. And people, what they do is they wrestle with that. Oh, this can't be true. There's got to be a scientific or some kind of uh, logical reason for this not to be true, right? So what do they do? They continue to live the way they want to, and this, the Scriptures are saying that they're holding down the very truth that God has communicated to them. And that's why he says, verse 20, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived or clearly seen ever since the creation of the world and the things that, are be, that, are, that have been made so that they are without excuse. They are without excuse. No one has an excuse, excuse to say there is no God. Why? God has already revealed himself. In their hearts, they know the truth. but They're holding it down, holding it down. God has left a witness of himself to all mankind since the beginning. His message from God has been coming to each and individual person, revealing that he's powerful, revealing that he's intelligent, and this is coming on a continuous basis. This is coming in an abundant fashion. This is coming to our universal audience on a continuous basis over and over again. And this makes you think that, man, there ought to be countless of people who would be searching for the truth, countless of people searching to find who God is, though He is not far from any of us. But instead, what you and I know to be true is that our human sinful nature doesn't want God to rule over us, doesn't want God to tell us how to live our life. And so we hold down the truth. We hold it down so that we can have one more, one more thrill of selfishness, one more passion of indulgence and some kind of sinful activity, one more. Day after day, we keep on holding it down, holding it down. And you know people that are doing this. And maybe you're here this morning and you are doing that. You're holding it down, hoping for one more day of pleasure without God telling you how to live your life. But day in and day out, God's voice is coming to you through creation telling you that I am God. I've created this on a continuous basis. In an abundant fashion, you are hearing it, and it's coming to you in a language that you can understand. Paul says, what may, what may be known of God is plain to them. It is obvious. From the petals of a flower to a blade of grass to a snowflake 
to the inquisies of an atom, to the very nature of light, to the laws of gravity, the second law of thermodynamics, all testify of a divine mind who created all these things. And lastly, of this universal witness of and to God in creation, he says the Son is a particular example of this witness. In verses 5 and 6, he says, In them he has set a tabernacle for the Son, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven excuse me, and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. And so what David is saying here is the sun is reacting to how glorious God is in creation. The sun is reacting, that it reveals how glorious God is, like a bridegroom coming out to meet his new bride on wedding day and a strong man who runs his race with joy. Both speak of how the sun comes out shining, re rejoicing, beaming with this, this unbelievable light, celebrating the God of creation. And so David looking up there, examining the sun, you know, long day out there working in the field, watching the sun go, the sun rise and the sun set. So he's giving his take on how he sees it, right? You know, obviously, this is not a, a scientific thing here. This is how he sees it in a poetic way, how the sun is rising and setting, right? And so he's observing this, and it's kind of like he says in poetic way, it's kind of like a bridegroom coming out to meet his new bride, right, on the wedding day, or a runner who's running a race with unbelievable joy because he's about to win that race. He's just using poetic language to celebrate creation and how the sun is, is put there and celebrating all that God has done. Skeptics will look at verse 6 where it says, its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end to say, there you go. You know, the, ri the, uh, the sun doesn't rise, the sun doesn't set. It's, it's basically showing us, oh, this is a foolish book, you shouldn't believe it. But this is just poetic language. David is using it from this his perspective, how we see it happening. Of course, the earth is rotating and it moves in relation to the sun, creating this illusion for us to see it rising and setting. And so my friend, this is God's word book. His witness to all people everywhere that there is a creator. And we call this general revelation. It's not enough to save a person, right? But it is enough. It is enough to to condemn a person. To know how to be saved, obviously you need to know God's word. You need, to, you need to come to know who Jesus Christ is. But it's enough to condemn you. Because if you stay in that state where you say there is no God, I'll live my life the way I want to, right? You might know someone that does that. They're left with no excuse because God has revealed himself to that person and they will be separated from God forever and ever in the lake of fire. In verse 6 is a key phrase that says, nothing is hidden from its heat. Every corner and every crevice is exposed to this revelation. God has left himself of a witness of himself to all people. And so the question as I end my message this morning is, what does this knowledge do for you? What should this knowledge do for you today? Well, if you're here this morning and you are not a believer, you don't know the Lord, you don't believe that you need him in your life, please know that the Lord is communicating to you. He is communi communicating to you through the very creation that he has created. And he's saying to you, I love you. I care about you. I'm providing for your, your needs. And I'm doing that so that you would know that I exist and that I am caring for you and that you would seek me, though I am not far from you. But your sins have separated you from God. And today, he commands all people everywhere to repent, to turn from their sins and to trust the Lord Jesus Christ because he's appointed a day in which he's going to judge all people through that one man, Jesus. And so today, I would encourage you, if you are here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to humble yourself and to trust him. If you are a believer, I pray as Psalm 19 encourages, encourages you and strengthens your faith. May it give you boldness in your witness to know that everyone you meet Everyone that you talk to, 
God has revealed himself to that individual. No matter how that first reaction or that, that face that they put on regarding what they know to be true, in your heart, know that God has already revealed and is revealing himself to that individual. They know that there is a God. They might deny it. They might have reasons for that denial, but they have to deal with that because God has revealed himself to that individual. But may it give you greater boldness to speak up for the Lord, to know that whatever sphere of influence he has placed you in, that you can have greater boldness and greater confidence in your witness, that you can even use creation, the very things that God has created to witness to that individual. May this psalm produce in you an awe for the God who created all the things that we see. And may the next time you look at that sky or look at something that God has created, may it create some kind of joy in your heart to know that God has placed that there for you to see that he loves you and he cares about you and he's put that witness for you. Amen? Father, I pray that uh, you would have uh, your way in, in all of our hearts. We do thank you, God, for your witness to us, your wonderful creation that you've given to us to, to tell us, Lord, that you love us, you care about us, and you've given us a witness of yourself and the very things that you have made. And Lord, it doesn't matter how far and how deep that we study these things, the deeper you go, the more you'll see that, they're, that you are the God who created all things. And I pray, God, that you would uh, help us today as a church to have greater confidence in you, greater boldness in you to worship you daily and also to witness for you to tell others about the God who created all things. Lord, I pray you use us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Why don't we all stand and sing this song of response.